So I'm here at Nebraska Medicine Specialty Care Center talking with Dr. Gina Mora. Today, I'm going to be asking her questions around transgender men and hysterectomies with the hope that it can dispel some myths that we may have heard around hysterectomies and being transgender and provide us with some more information if it is a surgical option that we are considering or, or currently seeking. So my first question, yeah. is it absolutely necessary to have a hysterectomy if you're a transgender man on hormones? No. All right. Simple answer to that one. Great. You know, we used to think that um, there was the potential for increased risk of um, abnormal cells inside the lining of the uterus, so endometrial cancer or even ovarian cancer. There have been no studies demonstrating that transgender men have any higher risk and probably, in fact, have a lower risk of endometrial cancer than anyone else. They're, their uterus tends to look similar to that of a cisgender woman after menopause. Hmm. Um, and so, because typically their, their estrogen levels on testosterone are quite low. And so there's not a, a, um, there's not a medical risk to keeping the uterus and ovaries as you transition. If guys are starting to experience extreme cramping, after beginning on hormones. Does that mean there's something terrible, wrong, terribly wrong with them? Or is this something that's yeah. quite common when people begin on testosterone? Yeah, it, it is quite common and does not signal really any problem. So the way that I usually would approach that would be to try to talk through, is this cramping that has the sensation really of being like menstrual cramping? So, um, but they're not bleeding and that's the phenomenon that is not clearly understood, but we do know that it's common and mm -hmm. is not worrisome. Now, people may have other types of pelvic pain, or certainly if people have irregular bleeding, there may be other reasons to seek an evaluation. But that cramping, and you know, the, it can sometimes be unnerving for folks because it's cramping similar to what they may have had when they were having periods. Mm -hmm. Then on testosterone, the periods stop and yet the cramping continues, um, maybe just sporadically. Often men will describe pretty intense period-like cramping, but that occurs specifically with orgasm. Mm -hmm. That's a quite common phenomenon um, and is a terrible nuisance for people, but is not actually a worrisome symptom. Has any research shown anything that can help alleviate or decrease the amount of cramping or pain that trans men experience? Yeah, unfortunately at this moment we don't have much other than um, on the very you know, low intervention and um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like mm -hmm. ibuprofen that sometimes I will counsel people to maybe try to use as a pre-medication if they're able to take that kind of medication to use it before experiences that they expect are going to cause them to have more cramping. Um, so before sex, what have you. But um, then we go sort of all the way, if it's bad enough to the extreme of that may be a reason that they want to pursue hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. And for disclosure, that was a reason why I was able to pursue a hysterectomy because I had extreme cramping that was lasting two to three weeks out of every month mm -hmm. and I couldn't even sleep at night because of it. Um, so when they went in to do the hysterectomy, um, the peer review board said, yes, it was medically necessary, and they yeah. said that I had multiple cysts on my ovaries and on my fallopian tubes. Then they also said I had dysplasia of the cervix, but oftentimes they say testosterone mimics that, correct? Testosterone can make evaluation of the cervix and of pap smears even a little bit tricky, where frequently it's, again, it kind of will often look like the tissue of someone who's of a cisgender woman who's postmenopausal mm -hmm. or something. So it can be a little bit harder to interpret. And this is one of these situations where I always want to make sure when I'm sending that test to the lab that the that the pathologist looking at it in the lab is aware of the clinical situation, that this is a, the uterus or the pap smear or whatever of someone who's on testosterone. That's so that they can enough. try to interpret it in that context. For guys that are seeking a hysterectomy, is it absolutely necessary that they also remove their ovaries? It's not. So for someone who is um, seeking a hysterectomy for a 
gynecologic reason that does not involve the ovaries, um, we don't necessarily need to take the ovaries out. For someone seeking, his, so say for fibroids, or mm. for abnormal bleeding, or for pelvic pain, etc., um, we, we don't usually take the ovaries out in a cisgender woman um, until she's quite a bit older, probably age 60 or so. So for a trans guy, if it is for a gynecologic reason, he may want ovaries out, but they wouldn't necessarily need to come out if the surgery was primarily being done for a bleeding or pain or you know fibroid issue. Um, for trans men that are seeking hysterectomy in the context of gender dysphoria and being bothered by female organs being present, etc., that, that they feel that this is not aligning with their gender identity, that in and of itself may be a, a totally reasonable um, reason to want ovaries out at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, I think it should be regarded really as, as two different decisions to be made by somebody. So there's the decision about having the uterus out, the reasons that someone may want to retain their ovaries, even as they're having a hysterectomy, um, would be a couple of things. One would be that it would allow them to maintain the option of potentially having genetically related kids in the future. That even without the uterus, they could use the eggs in their ovaries to conceive a child that someone else could carry, that a surrogate could carry. So that would be one reason. And the other is that um, when you have both ovaries taken out in a young person, and again, I'm talking about anybody, say, under 50 or 60, when you have both ovaries taken out, you, you're committing essentially to needing for your bone health to be on testosterone for quite a long time because you now don't have any of the estrogen being made. Mm -hmm. um, and so that may be a reason that some people would want to keep their ovaries because if you take out the ovaries and then later stop the testosterone shots, that can actually create a health risk for you. That's important to know yeah. for folks. We need hormones one way or the other. Yes. We need hormones in our yes. body. Uh, one final question around hysterectomies. So for folks that do seek it, what's the most common procedure done today? Uh, so I would say for trans men, most commonly it's done laparoscopically, um, which does create a few incisions on the belly, but they're pretty small. The recovery is usually quite short, um, where they're able to be out of the hospital that day or the next day, that kind of thing. Um, the, the preferred route for hysterectomy would be actually vaginal mm -hmm. for anybody with a uterus. That may not always be possible. And then kind of the next preferred would be to do it laparoscopically. Um, but to have it done vaginally, if it's possible, it would, you know, just technically possible. And the OBGYN would be the person to do that evaluation and discuss if they think that route would be reasonable. But then you're, you, you're left with no abdominal incisions at all and that we know that that route of hysterectomy has overall the lowest risk and the lowest blood loss and that sort of thing so mm -hmm. if that's possi technically possible as judged by the surgeon that's the way to go but again for, i'd say for most trans men it's it's more feasible done laparoscopically well i know from my experience they did both they used mm -hmm. they did use the lapo and then they also remove the uterus through the vaginal canal yep so, and I can say for myself with this surgery, um, it was easier to recover from from some of the other procedures I've had. I, I know for me personally, the main thing I experienced for about three months was just being extremely tired. I was very, very tired and I felt very weak, uh, but eventually that did subside. So always listen to your doctor and uh, listen to what they give you as far as advice afterwards. I hope that they've updated the manuals because I know for me when I was in recovery, they gave me a manual for what I should do after my hysterectomy, and it said, do not vacuum. And it showed this woman vacuuming. <laughs> so it was very gender stereotyped in that sense, which actually yeah. is really sad for me because I love to vacuum. Yeah. But <laughs> and, and 
time warped a little bit too. Definitely, <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Um, so there's what you have for information around hysterectomy. Uh, if you're interested in these topics and you want to hear more from myself and Dr. Amora, please check out my channel where we also talk about creating affirming healthcare facilities and also, you've briefly mentioned, family planning and fertility options when you are transgender. Thank you, Jean. Thanks.